Good morning, friends. Welcome to Calaveras Big Tree State Park. My name is Jenny, and we are going on a little read aloud adventure together today. We're going to learn about a very, very special tree that grows here in the mountains of California called the giant sequoia. So I am inside our visitor center today, and we have it all to ourselves because the visitor center is closed. But our park is still open. It's just a little rainy outside today. So we're going to be inside for our read aloud. And you can see we have some animals behind me here. This is our exhibit in our museum. And this park is very special to California's history because of the giant sequoia. These trees are extremely rare and they grow right here in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. So they're gonna be the star of our field trip today. And my name is Jenny and I work here as a park interpreter and Calaveras Big Trees is the park that I interpret and educate people on and students from all around the world. So I'm not sure where you're from today, but if you want to put it in your little comments, you can tell me where you're from. And I will look at your comments towards the end of our field trip. And let's see, our plan today is that we're going to read a story together and then we're going to learn about the park. Calaveras Big Trees and about the giant sequoia and why they're so special and why they're in a park. So if you have something to say to me, you can put them in the comments, but I have to warn you, I might not get to read them all. I have a special person here on our little read aloud that's gonna help me moderate. And we're gonna get more to, our, to your questions at the end of our presentation today. So let's get started with our story. And I'm assuming you all like stories, right? You're probably all in kindergarten, first or second grade. And I remember when I was that age, I loved to read books. So today we're gonna to read a book. It's called The Sequoia Lives On. And it's written by a woman named Joanna Cook and illustrated by Fiona Hess. Giant sequoias are living wonders. In groves scattered along the Sierra Nevada, a mountain range in California, sequoias dwarf all of their neighbors. No other trees are as tall and wide and magnificent. Stand beneath the sequoia and anything seems possible. Gaze into its branches and wonder how the sequoia lives on. The giant sequoia is Earth's most massive tree. The height of three blue whales stacked chin to tail and weighing even more. It begins life as most trees do, as a seed, a flake no bigger than an ant. How does such a tiny seed grow into a tree as heavy as 300 elephants? Whoa, now that is a big tree. 300 elephants? How much does 300 elephants weigh? Well, I'll tell you, they can weigh, depending on the elephant, between 8,000 and 13,000 pounds. How much do you weigh? You probably weigh maybe like 40 pounds. So these are some big trees and they grow just like every other plant from a seed, a tiny little seed. And we'll look at these seeds after our little story here. But think about how a seed grows. A seed needs a few things, right? A seed probably is gonna need some sunshine. A seed's probably gonna need some water and a place to grow, right? But our giant sequoias are very special trees, so they need a few more things. A few more things. In fact, the sequoia seed relies on fire. A blaze crawls on the forest floor, clearing away fallen leaves and broken branches. 
in which a seed might disappear. Rising heat from the fire warms the sequoia's cones, drying and opening them. Then, setting the brown seeds adrift in smoke-filled air, they float toward a place to grow. Isn't that wild? A seed needs fire to grow? Who would have thought? But sometimes the forest floor gets a little dirty. It gets full of dried leaves and broken branches, and a tiny little seed might not get to grow and all that. So fire helps clean the forest sometimes. So it's hard to think of fire as a good thing, but sometimes it is. Because then, a newly uncovered soil, a seed wrap rest in a shaft of sunlight. Roots anchor it to the ground, and a seedling grows up and up toward golden beams of light shining through the canopy, the highest layer of branches in the forest. Up and up the seedling reaches for sunlight that has traveled all the way from the sun to the earth. And there it is right here. Our little seedling, we call a baby tree a seedling. And who do we have up here? What is there in the branch? Yeah, an owl. We have a lot of birds <clears throat> that make their home in the branches of the giant sequoia. But an owl is one of those birds that it's hard to see during the day because the owl's nocturnal. And I'm sure you all know what nocturnal means. Yeah, we aren't nocturnal, are we? No, but a lot of animals are because they like to sleep during the day and they come out at night. So the owl does that. It's hard to see them during the day. So we talked about fire and sunshine and a seed also needs a couple other things, right? Sequoia leaves take in that sunlight and also air, exhale, and your breath can become food for a sequoia and the sequoia lives on. Let's all take a big breath together, everyone. Ready? <gasps> and now blow it out. We just fed our giant sequoias. Oh yes, they need air to grow. They need some other things too. Look at this. When fire is absent, in a sequoia grove, the seeds rely on other help. Furry chicory squirrels grip the bark with little claws in search of a sequoia cone to feast on. The seeds are too small for a meal, so they fall to the ground and with luck may sprout. The longhorn beetle lays its eggs on a cone. And when the larvae hatch, they eat through the scales and part of the stem, causing the cone to dry and open. Again, the seeds fall. So just like us, sometimes you need to rely on your friends for help to get your seeds to grow. Our giant sequoia has two really good friends here, the chicory squirrel and the longhorn beetle. Buried in the earth, a sequoia's roots reach outward, creating a hidden foundation as wide as the tree is tall. Each day, a large sequoia's roots absorb enough water to fill more than eight bathtubs. Wow, that's a lot of water. And that is why the giant sequoia likes to live here in the mountains. We get a lot of water, but we don't really get it in the form of rain. Think about the mountains. Do you have mountains where you live? Well, mountains are high, aren't they? Our mountains here are about 4,000 feet above sea level. And that means we get water in the form of snow. Now there's a lot of snow outside right now. 
and sometimes we get up to four feet of snow. From across the forest, a sequoia's colorful bark almost glows. Thicker at the tree's base than at the top, the spongy bark swells, and that supports the sequoia's growing bulk. And look who we have here. What are those? Do you have mule deer where you live? Because we have them here. A lot of animals make their home here. And we're gonna learn about them after this read aloud. So how long will it take for a new sequoia seedling to become so big? Well, us humans can live more than 80 years, which is a mere blink in the life of a sequoia. After 200 human lifetimes, oh, I'm sorry, after two human lifetimes, so about 160 years, a sequoia will have grown old enough to make cones. And then, with enough sunlight, air, and water, a mighty sequoia can live more than 30 human lifetimes. That's about 3,000 years. Imagine a sequoia so old and so huge, not even a ring of 20 children holding hands could hug it. 20 children holding hands. Let's think about that. So let's think about your classroom. Let's think about how many students are in your classroom at school. 20 children. Are there 20 children in there? Well, think about that if there are. That's how many it takes to make a circle around one giant sequoia. They're really fat trees. Some are so big I have to turn the whole book. They are giants among giants. Look at that one. And look at those little tiny people down there. Yeah, sometimes we call the giant sequoia the skyscrapers of the forest because they can grow to be as tall as a building, sometimes as tall as a 30 story building. An old sequoia's trunk may be hollowed out by fire. Its crown, once pointed like a pyramid, is now a snag top, broken by lightning and wind. Lower branches grow upward, filling openings in the canopy. The expanded crown holds more leaves, which means more food for growing. Even black and scarred, an old sequoia can produce a gallon of tiny seeds, more than 300,000 in one year. And the sequoia lives on. That's a lot of seeds. Think about a gallon of milk. These can fill a gallon of milk in one year. Uh-oh. These trees can't live forever though, can they? Over time, such immensity can harm a giant sequoia. Season after season, its branches thicken and grow heavy, broader than nearby pine trees and cedar trees. The branches overwhelm the damaged trunk and shallow roots, and the sequoia falls over, shaking the ground upon impact. The tree shatters into car-sized blocks and toothpick tiny pieces. And still, the sequoia lives on. Stretched across the forest floor, the giant sequoia decomposes over hundreds of years. The massive trunk now rests side by side with new seedlings, reaching for golden beams of light and the cycle of the giants begins again with one tiny seed. The end. So there you have it, the sequoia lives on. 
These are incredible trees, I told you. So let's talk a little bit more about trees because I really like trees, do you? I bet you have a lot of trees where you live. Small trees, big trees. And we're gonna talk about the giant sequoia bark for a second here. So <clears throat> I have a piece here of bark from a giant sequoia. Now, do you notice this bark, the color of it? Does it look a little red to you? The giant sequoia have red bark. We sometimes call them redwood trees for a reason, because their bark is very red. They stand out against all the other brown trees in the forest. Even inside the tree is red. Look at this. I have a little piece of giant sequoia wood in my hand. And the color of the wood is a little bit red here. This is the very, very, very inside part of the tree. And then they also have a light brown wood too. So we call these trees redwood trees sometimes. They have a nickname. And we call them Sierra Redwoods because they grow here in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. And these mountains take up about a quarter of California's land mass. There's a lot of mountains in our state. So I'm about maybe three hours away from the ocean. And that's where these trees like to grow because as you remember from the story, they like water, don't they? They need a lot of water, eight bathtubs worth of water in one day. So that's why they like to live here in the mountains. Very important part. Of hey, Ranger Jenny, this is your moderator, Jennifer. Hi. We have some kids that have some questions they would love to ask you. Would you like to have some questions? Yes, I think we should talk about those questions and then we'll talk about a few more things. Excellent. So one of the first questions we have from Lisa, she wants to know, how did Big Tree State Park get Calaveras in its name? Ooh, do you speak Spanish? Because Calaveras is a Spanish word. And Calaveras is the county I'm in, just like you all live in a county in whatever state you're in. And the name of this county is called Calaveras. And it's named after a creek called Calaveras Creek. And if you speak Spanish, you might know what the word Calaveras means. And it means skull. So the story goes that there were some skulls found in the river around here. And that gave our county its name and it gave this park its name. It was named after the county. Cool. All right, we have a question from Elizabeth. How do the trees get so big and then Ava asks how long do the trees live? Good question. So the giant sequoia gets so big because they get very old and the older a tree gets it usually gets bigger right just like you you're gonna get bigger as you get older so our giant sequoias keep growing and growing and growing and they can live sometimes between two and three thousand years old. So imagine how big that tree might be if it's a 3,000 year old giant sequoia. Because you saw from the book, the seedlings are like this big. So that's why they're big, they're just old trees. And the older a tree gets, the bigger it gets. For example, I have a little piece here of wood from the inside of a giant sequoia. And every line you see here is a year in its life. So every single year, a giant sequoia gets bigger and bigger and puts on more on its trunk and its branches. So I hope that answers both those questions. Do you want to take a few more questions or would you like to move on to? Sure, let's take two more and then we're going to talk about seeds. Two more. Excellent. Okay, so Addie wants to know how tall can a tree grow? Mm. Well, here's the thing about a giant sequoia. They are not the tallest trees on earth. They are the biggest trees on earth by their volume. So volume might be a new word. You might never heard that word before, but that just refers to the whole size of the tree. So if you put together the, the trunk, the roots, the branches, the needles, the whole thing, they're the biggest tree. 
and we estimate our biggest one to be about 317 feet tall. And a blue whale is about 90 to 100 feet long. So that means it takes three blue whales to equal the height of a tall giant sequoia. And if you picture, you might be familiar with the Statue of Liberty in New York. If you picture that statue now in your imagination, the giant sequoia is actually taller than the Statue of Liberty. Isn't that amazing? They're really big trees. Wow, that really is incredible. And one last question um, we have from James. How many animals live in a single tree? Wow, James, now that is a good question. And I wish I could tell you that answer, but I can't climb the trees and find out. I can guess, I would say we have a lot of insects up there, a lot of different birds. Uh, there's animals with fur that live in trees, right? Like squirrels. Yeah, I would say probably at least 10 different animals up there between the birds and the squirrels and the little, um, little insects. But yeah, a lot of animals make their home inside a giant sequoia. They're like a living apartment building. All right, friends. Well, we talked about the bark of the giant sequoia and I wanna talk about the seeds because these big trees actually start off their life as a teeny tiny seed, about the size of oatmeal. So I have some seeds here in my hand. I'm gonna put them out here in my hand, bring them up to the camera. So you can see what a giant sequoia looks like when it starts off its life. Check that out. So that is a handful of seeds right there. And the seeds are inside of a cone. So we call a giant sequoia a conifer tree because they have cones. And cones come in all different shapes and sizes. For instance, look at this cone. Wow. This cone is bigger than the camera, isn't it? It's bigger than my head but it's not a giant sequoia cone, is it? No, you probably remember from the story, they have a very small cone. There was a little beetle sitting on the cone. So their cones look like this, check it out. And inside of this cone are those tiny seeds I just showed you. There could be hundreds inside one little cone. And this cone belongs to a different tree, it came from a sugar pine. And sugar pines have one of the biggest cones here. They can be three feet long sometimes. And these cones hang on the branch like a little ornament. And they open up like you see here. And the seeds can come out. So the seeds to the sugar pine are in the cone here. So the cones are designed to protect the seeds. And sometimes the cones are a little overprotective. Sometimes the seeds don't want to come out of this cone. They get stuck in there. But you can see how this cone's starting to open. Get a little cracks in here. And when the cones open, the seeds can come out. So the seeds get to travel around and find a good spot to grow with the wind. The wind helps to spread the seeds around. But do you remember from the story, the giant sequoia had two really close friends Two really close friends that helped to get the seeds out of the cone. Now one of them was the beetle and another one of the friends was a little furry animal with a bushy tail. Let's see, is there one behind me here? There is, there's one up in the tree. Can you see him? The chicory squirrel. Yeah, they like to eat these cones, but they don't really want the seeds. You saw how little those seeds were. They like to eat the outer part of the cone. And when they do that, then the seeds fall all over because they're very messy eaters. They're dropping seeds all over just as they're eating a cone. So they help our giant sequoias get planted because even though I'm working here in a park and our park is about maybe 6,500 acres, 
we don't really plant the trees. We sort of let them plant themselves. So the squirrels help us out. Speaking of animals, now behind me here, you see a little exhibit. There's all kinds of animals here. The biggest one you can see is that bear, isn't it? The black bear is probably gonna be our biggest animal here at the park. And black bears are pretty common. I've seen some here. I've seen a mama and three babies. All summer long, she was walking the trails with her three babies and we call a baby bear a cub. So the bear is gonna be our largest animal here. And let's see, what else do we have here in our exhibit? And you can see his little baby right here, the little baby bear cub right here. And we have some smaller animals here. So now let's think about small animals. So if we have a small animal here that's green, it's about this big and it likes to hop, what do you think that animal might be? Think about it. An animal that's green and likes to hop. Do you think it's a grasshopper? Is a grasshopper an animal or is a grasshopper an insect? Do you think it might be a frog? Now that would be a good guess. Oh, somebody guessed it. Amber says a frog. Good job, Amber. So I'm going to show you a picture here. It's going to come up on your screen, I hope. Oh, I don't know if I can share pictures. Hmm. Let's see if I can. Oh, there he goes. There's our frog. Can you all see him? Can you see that Pacific tree frog? Yeah, we can see it. That's amazing. So that's one of our smallest animals here. Now frogs are one of my favorite animals. <clears throat> People ask me all the time on my field trips, they say, Jenny, what's your favorite animal at the park? And it changes all the time. But I have to say ever since I was little, I loved frogs. And this little guy is one of our smallest animals here. And it can be green or brown. They're actually amazing frogs. They can change color like magic. And that's a finger behind that frog. So that just shows you how little they are. And frogs you can find in all different kinds of places. A lot of times you find them in the water. We have rivers here. And a lot of times you find them on the trees. That's why they're called Pacific tree frogs. And even though they are so little, they're actually very, very loud. They make this very loud ribbit croaking noise. And oftentimes you only get to see the an or hear the animals. You don't always get to see them because we have over 80 different animals here and they're wild. A lot of times they're hiding because we're a pretty popular park. We have the most amazing trees in the world here, the giant sequoia. People come from all over to see them. So the animals are shy sometimes. Even though I work here almost every day, I rarely get to see the animals. And there's another animal here. Now, I'm gonna move this camera to show you our exhibit here. Now, this animal is probably one of the most colorful animals at the park. And it's sitting right here on the rock. Can you all see that little animal? Now, that is a snake. And it's called a mountain king snake and they are very beautiful. You can see the red, the white and the black. Sometimes they're orange, white and black. Sometimes they're even yellow, white and black. But oftentimes they have this color variation and they are one of the most colorful animals here. And some people are scared of snakes. Now this is not a snake to be scared of. A mountain king snake doesn't really have venom that's strong enough to hurt people or sometimes even animals because they're called a constrictor snake. Have you heard of the word constrictor? It's a big word, I know. But all it means is to squeeze something really tight. So that's how the mountain king snake 
eats. It squeezes things like that little tree frog and rodents and birds really tight. And then it can swallow the animal. So that's how it makes its living here, squeezing things. So those are just some of our animals here. And we have over 80 different animals here at the park. Yeah, we talked about the big ones and the small ones. And we're getting to the end of our field trip today of our little read aloud session. And I think I wanna take a few more questions before we wrap it up. So does anyone have anything else they wanna know about our animals or the giant sequoia? I have a question from Sydney that wants to know how are frogs and toads different? Ooh, that's a good question. Now I have to admit, I'm not a frog expert. So I don't really know the difference. I think some are, I always thought a toad was more of like a land type of frog and frogs are like a water type of frog, but I don't know. I mean, I wish I knew more about frogs to answer that question, but I'm not an expert. Toads though, are, they're kind of more like, they look different than a frog. Frogs are like sleek and they have different skin. Toads are more like lumpy. So I don't really know the, the answer. You might have to look that up on your own at home. Uh, Tracy wants to know, are bears hibern hibernating right now? Oh, no, that is a really good question because as we know, bears hibernate, don't they? And hibernate means that they sleep in the winter and they come out in the springtime. But I heard a story, I heard a rumor, I guess you'd say the other day, just a few weeks ago, someone saw our mother bear and her cubs. And it's winter. There's snow outside and it's cold. So maybe that bear is, is getting ready to come out. Maybe she never went into hibernation. We don't know. But yeah, usually in the winter, the bears are not around. But someone I heard saw our bear recently. Cool. Some kids are asking if the mountain king snake is poisonous and if it comes in other colors. Now, it's not known as a poisonous or venomous snake. Now, we do have a snake here that is. In fact, one of our most dangerous animals in California is a snake. And I bet you can guess what snake that is. I'll give you a hint, it makes a noise. Anyone have a guess? A noisy snake? Oh, yeah, a couple couple people are replying rattlesnake. That's right. That's right. The Pacific rattlesnake is probably our most dangerous animal here at the park. And they're a venomous snake. So their venom is so powerful, you have to go to the doctor if it bites you. But a mountain king snake, no. They are known as a snake that does not have a strong venom. As I mentioned earlier, they're a constrictor snake. So they're going to squeeze to kill instead of biting to kill. So they're not a poisonous snake. All right, someone wants to know what do the bears eat? Now that is a good question. So bears are what's called an omnivore. Now that's probably a big word for some of you at home. And some animals eat plants, some animals eat meat, some animals eat both. So we're an omnivore, aren't we? Most of us. Now I'm a vegetarian, but some of you probably eat meat and plants. Our bears eat meat and plants. And a bear though, their favorite food ever, you wanna think is honey, but they actually love grubs and insects too. So they eat a lot of berries, grubs, insects, all kinds of things. And they're probably gonna go for a plant or an insect or a grub before they actually kill an animal. That's what I've read. And we have to protect our bears here at the park because sometimes bears like to eat human food. They have a very, very good sense of smell, better than a dog's. So we have to keep our food locked up when you come here to camp with your family. We have lockers in the campgrounds so you have to lock up your food if you leave your campsite. So our bears don't get it. 
because they're very, very hungry. As you can imagine, a big animal like that likes to eat a lot of food. So yeah, they like to eat plants and animals and bugs. Ranger Jenny Paisley wants to know, what are grubs? Ooh, grubs are gross. Yeah, they look like little tiny um, worms. Um, maybe you can look it up after, the, um, after our field trip right now on the computer and see what they look like. They're, I don't have any pictures on my computer, otherwise I'd show you. But yeah, they look like little mealworms. I don't know, they're hard to describe. Like little stubby little worms. Okay, did you want to take any more questions? Let's see, what's, what's our time here? It, maybe two more questions and then we'll, we'll conclude our little field trip here today. Excellent. Um, Tamara would like to know how many cubs can a bear have? Ooh, well, it depends on the health of that mama bear, doesn't it? I've read that they can have one, two, maybe three, sometimes even four cubs. That's a lot of cubs to take care of. Yeah, they are um, amazing animals. The one we had here had three babies. And I can show you a picture of our mama bear. I actually have one here on my computer. So I took this picture right outside of our visitor center just a few months ago. And this is gonna show you how close that bear was to our visitor center. Whoops, I'm sorry, everyone. It's gonna come, there it is. Let me know when you can see that picture. We can see it. So there you see the mama bear on the left and her three cubs. Now these cubs are big. They're big. This was just a few months ago, but in the spring and the winter, they were really little, about the size of a, of a really fat house cat. So now they're really big. And again, this was right outside the building I'm sitting in. So they got pretty close to the building over the summer. And they're really, really cute and fun to watch, but you have to remember one important thing about wildlife, and that is you never wanna to get too close because they're unpredictable, these bears. That mama bear can get very um, upset if you're too close to her babies. So you always wanna give a safe distance. That's why when I took this picture, I was really far away. I did not wanna to get too close to that bear, even though I work here. All right, Ranger Jenny, we have one more curious question from Gage. He wants to know, what is that brown animal on the wall behind you? Is that a mountain lion? That is, in fact, that is another one of our large animals here. Let's see if I can get a little closer so you can see it. Um, mountain lions are incredible animals. And they are, next to the bear, they're probably one of the largest animals we have here. And mountain lions are very, very secretive. I've never seen one, thank goodness. And mountain lions, their favorite food to eat is an animal from our story. You might remember the little drawing of the mule deer. That's their favorite, favorite food. So yeah, we have lions here in the mountains of California. Isn't that crazy? Good eye, I'm glad you saw that. Okay, well, we have so many more questions, Jenny, but I'm sure maybe we can take a look at those after our broadcast today and okay. find a way to get out some answers. But um, yeah, we have lots, lots more questions that are coming in, and obviously we're running out of time. So I will let you go ahead and wrap things up. Well, everyone, I want to sincerely thank you for joining me today on this um, home learning program. And we did so much on our little adventure, didn't we? We read a story. We learned about a very special tree, the giant sequoia, the world's most massive tree. We learned about how they grow. We got to talk about some of our animals here at Calaveras Big Tree State Park, from the tiniest, tiniest, the tree frog, to the biggest, our black bear here. And I just want to sincerely thank you for joining me, Jenny, today. And just a reminder that we are doing a lot of programs for you all while you're at home away from school because we believe that it's important to share the love 
of our state parks with students near and far. And please check that out with your parents. And uh, yeah, if you get a chance, check out Calaveras Big Tree State Park here in California if you're here visiting. So thanks everyone for joining me today. Have a wonderful week. Bye everyone.